Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, January 15th, 1870, in the pages of Harper's Weekly, we find the first recorded use of a donkey to represent the Democratic Party. We, of course, now know that the Democratic Party is generally represented by a donkey, the Republicans by an elephant, but that had to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is the pages of Harper's Weekly in January of 1870. We'll also get into the origins of the Republican elephant, which is around this same time as well. So here we are many, many, many years later, still living with those two animals. Here to discuss, as always, are Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. I'm really resisting the urge to hee-haw into the microphone. So oh, yeah. just, I'll just say hello, well, wait. Jody. Hee-haw is a donkey. What's a, an elephant is a... What's, oh. the, what's the name for the sound that an elephant makes? I don't think there I is a name know. for it. A There's trumpet? Like- a trumpet. Uh, yeah. That's pretty good. I can't yeah. make that sound, so yeah. hey there. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Um, <laughs> while, we're, while we're on the mascot territory, I just it was just occurring to me, what is Vanderbilt's mascot? What is Wellesley's mascot? Do we know? Do you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Vanderbilt know. are the ah. doors, the Commodores. The Commodores. Oh, they they shorten it to that. doors? <laughs> That's I mean, amazing. there are a lot, of, well, a lot of issues baked into that. <laughs> oh, with a Commodores shirt. Like a lion, a bear? Oh, I should know. <laughs> it's blue and white. A bird. A oh, bird. somebody help me out. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now, and I don't know. I'll I'll Google it You're and blue. find out. <laughs> You're the Ravens. The Ravens. The, well, it's no, never okay. had. No, it's never had a mascot. Oh, it just actually. says the blue. The it blue. It just says mascot. The blue. Wow, interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, that's my yeah. college. <laughs> a my, color. Our yeah. mascot's a color. <laughs> <laughs> my my high school was the Quakers, and we were the Fighting Quakers. And then, uh, and then in co- and then in college, it was um, the Cardinal, but it used to be the Methodists. Uh, and it was just like those are pretty weak. Were uh, you the Fighting we Quakers? Were. <laughs> we were the Fighting Quakers. Yeah. yeah. That's um, funny. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, donkeys and elephants i've always wondered where these came from i feel like now i kind of have a sense but i don't really have a rationale if that makes sense i have a story but i don't Mm -hmm. necessarily have an explanation but let's get into the story uh at the very least and it is quite complicated and a little and very esoteric about how this came about but it is basically from a cartoon illustrated by a man named thomas nast who did political illustrations and this one depicts a donkey um what is the political context in which uh the donkey is being used to represent democrats in 1870 as pithily as we think we can describe it so andrew jackson is on the campaign trail and uh he is considered you know a war hero of 1812 but his opponents want to create sort of a um a nickname for him and so they call him jackass and which were <laughs> fitting. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, kind of fitting. Uh, and funnily enough, he embraces it. He's kind of like, okay, you want to call me a jackass? I'll be a jackass. And so he, um, he sort of has like these um, illustrated, you know, cartoons of him as a jackass. And that really sticks. It becomes the thing that is part of his, you know, identity his campaign and it doesn't really stick for all of the democratic party but it does really stick for andrew jackson and become sort of the origin story for the yeah of the Do- so it's sort of in the 18 what 1820s and 30s and 40s it's a more andrew jackson specific thing he's the jackass and then it's sort of i think mostly because of this guy thomas nast gets sort of positioned as more about Democrats as a whole, which was Jackson's party. But, you know, there's the, the sort of lineage. Well, Nast is really the person who originates so many of our political symbols because he's the most famous and most wide-read political cartoonist of the late 19th century when you start to have these mass newspapers. And so he draws this cartoon in 1870 of a donkey kicking a lion. And because it's nasty, he, he labels everything. So we have a pretty good idea of what all of this stands for. And on the donkey, it says Copperhead Papers. That, that was just something that meant the the Democratic newspapers of the South after the Civil War. After the Civil War, um, and this donkey is kicking a lion who represented Abraham Lincoln, Secretary of War. And the idea is, you know, by 1870, the Democrats in the South are 
kicking down or sullying or desecrating the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. So at this moment, this donkey represents the Democrats, um, maybe just the Southern Democrats at this point, but it is the entry point for the larger representation of a donkey, just meaning Democrats. And and not in a favorable no. light. I mean, it depends what mm-hmm. from perspective, but basically it's showing, you know, this donkey is, is kicking a dead lion, we should add, that represents mm. Edwin Stanton, who was mm-hmm. Lincoln's Secretary of War. I'll also say in this cartoon, which, you know, maybe we'll post it on our social media, but you can go look it up, but, you know, it's called a live jackass kicking a dead lion. And you have this donkey representing the newspapers, but really that's representing the South. And it's kicking this lion, which represents a man, but it's really representing Lincoln. And then in the background, there's a eagle on a rock. And then there's the, which represents post-war federal domination of the South. And then in the background beyond that, there's the U.S. cap. I mean, it's like... It's layered. You know, <laughs> it's layered or complicated. I suppose, you know, readers at the time would get it. And, you know, I, I have to say... This is a bit of an aside. You know, I was looking at this. I was like, good God, you know, like (laughs) the things you would have to know to understand this. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about like those cartoons by that dude, like Ben Garrison or whatever, or like, you know, who who (laughs) writes these just like super complicated. And sometimes you see those and you're like, what is this guy talking about? But like, there's a lot of political cartoons out there now where you need to have like a decade's worth of very specific knowledge (laughs) and representation um, to understand. So maybe that's just the nature of political Mm -hmm. cartooning that they will, will always speak to a very specific moment and a bunch of specific references. But, you know, it is funny to me in this very first one, which is generally pinned as the place where this is sort of established. Um, the A, it's an anti-donkey uh, representation, right? He's, he's sort of d- disparaging the behavior of the, Demo- the Southern Democrats. There's also a lion right there. And I know the lion's dead, but I'm like, man, the lion would have been a great one for someone to embrace, right? And I mean, yeah. the Republicans yeah. in the party of Lincoln should have embraced the lion. But the elephant was also floating around this time as well. I just want to, before we get to that, I want to go to another cartoon which is another one Nast you know as we said Nast is sort of like beating this drum trying to make this a thing <laughs> I can just imagine Nast's <laughs> editor being like you're really doing the donkey thing again you really want this to be a thing huh <laughs> but um, there's another one it's this cartoon called Third Term Panic and in it uh, there's a lion wearing a, donkey. a lion a donkey, a donkey wearing the skin of a lion that's being a bogus lion and it's confronting an elephant but there's also a giraffe and there's a (laughs) a thing called chaos floating around there's a forest and uh, i mean it's even more complicated the politics of the jungle man i suppose i suppose (laughs) but Um, it actually has like what feels like a very contemporary message right it's the democrats are trying to scare everyone Mm -hmm. um so it has on like this lion costume to trick everyone into thinking that there's a threat that doesn't actually exist um and everyone's Mm -hmm. running scared and there's chaos because of uh, the the Democrats scare tactics which if you strip it down to the message it just feels extremely contemporary when you look at the image yeah. you're like what is happening well just the image yeah. of a live donkey wearing a, the skin of a dead lion is just like okay it's okay. a lot it's a it's lot, lot. And also the ele- also the elephant that's sort of teetering on this balance beam that's about to break i mean it's it's all chaos is breaking out and one missed up of the elephant and it's sort of all over for them. Um, There's, you know, if you did not have strong literacy skills in the 19th Mm -hmm. century, maybe these cartoons did a lot for you, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they gave you the imagery you needed to connect complex issues into sort of simple imagery. And I think that's what these cartoons did. For sure. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of even the sort of modern usage of these is that a strong brand is a strong brand and you can convey a lot visually. And, you know, and these days it's like, I mean, literacy maybe isn't as big of a challenge, but, you know, there's all sorts of like fractured media environment or people are watching TV with their sound off or whatever. And it's like, how do you communicate who we are? Well, these these sort of really ingrained visual uh, icons really, you know, play a role. And so that's, I think... If not to jump all the way to now, but that's why I think the parties have in large part, you know, kept these um, because they are so powerful. Your 
used to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. You want to talk about about the rise of the elephant? Because I did mention that it comes around sort of at the same time. And if the donkeys are representing the South, um, we know the North is the Republicans, the party of Lincoln at this time. Um, that it does feel like the elephant and Lincoln have a bit of a connection as well. Yeah, I mean, the elephant comes out of the Civil War. Um, apparently, there was this phrase um, during the Civil War that people used to describe being in combat. Being in combat, they called seeing the elephant. Um, and so because of that association between the war and Lincoln, um, that that iconography got intertwined together, that there was an association between the Republican Party, Lincoln, and elephants. And once again, it's Nast who makes that something that sticks, because every time he's representing the Republicans in his political cartoons, he's using this elephant. And over time, the Republicans are like... <sighs> Fine, we're elephants. Great, sure. we'll use that. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> Democrats were a lot slower because they were like, "Wait, are we? We're the jackasses? We like, don't come on. Really yeah. want to be <laughs> well, a donkey? <laughs> can totally. we be a horse? <laughs> Something yeah, more I mean, noble." <laughs> and so, so like you know, let's talk about that because I mean, you know, I think now we have a sense of the the specific origins here, which are the nickname for uh, Andrew Jackson being jackass, and then this sort of elephant phrase that then gets associated with the with the republicans and the party of lincoln you know nowhere in there is anything about the actual qualities of Mm -hmm. the animals Mm -hmm. and whether they are something you would want to embrace or even something that's like obvious right like i wouldn't Mm. say like anyone i mean you tell you know like we've talked a little bit about how some of these cartoons have a lion i feel like turn to anyone and be like what are the qualities of a lion and someone will tell you i don't know if anyone could really name the qualities necessarily the like emotional or behavioral qualities of a donkey or an mm-hmm. elephant um other than m- probably good negative memory. negative elephants ones i guess it's just good memory right memory. donkeys so, are stubborn yeah but like i you know as someone who dropped into politics just when i was born in my day and age i always was like what is going on here what are the qualities that you're trying to embrace mm. and you see people trying to work sort of twist themselves into knots to say oh yeah the donkey is like stubborn and and steadfast and resolute. I'm like, you wouldn't have chosen Donkey. You You wouldn't have chosen Donkey. (laughs) Though interestingly, like neither neither a donkey nor an elephant, I was just thinking of this because of your your mention of the lion, Jody, they're not martial animals. They're not they're they're not particularly violent animals, um, which given the way that Mm -hmm. politics can sometimes go, it's kind of Mm -hmm. nice that they're they're not kind of known for their viciousness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. I look, I'm really looking for a silver for lining. I know, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> so, you know. I'll take and, it. And I will say, like, I feel like I've been at, con- when I've covered conventions every once in a while, I feel like I hear a line at, like, the GOP convention. They're like, an elephant never forgets, and, you know, <laughs> won't ever forget Benghazi or whatever it is, you know. And, and then you hear at, at the, on the DNC side, I mean, I think there's even some official DNC language that's something about, like, well, yes, the donkey represents humbleness and courage. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Like, the donkey doesn't you know, it's like, yeah, you know, the donkey represents um, green energy and uh, retrofitting <laughs> for a future. Yeah, you know, it's just like it could be whatever you no. just put, say whatever a donkey is to match whatever you want. There's be not a whole lot moment. of outside of Shrek. There's not a whole lot uh-huh. of positive stories of donkeys. That's true. Which That's is why true. I do I think a- that, you know, if you go to the RNC, everyone's wearing like elephant hats and all mm-hmm. these like funny things um and i think you see a little bit less of that a on the democratic bit. side because yes. it's not oh, as yeah. much fun yeah. to dress up with a with, like donkey ears yeah. yeah yeah for sure there's also that synergy of um alabama football is represented by the elephant and that's a very red part of the country mm-hmm, and so i feel like mm-hmm. i've seen crossover sometimes there as well but yeah i mean i would think most people would choose there's, there's, there's a little bit more to embrace with an elephant than there is with a donkey, for sure. But um, there is this yeah. um, interesting tidbit, though, because the Alabama Democratic Party had Ooh. its official animal was the rooster. And the rooster decorated all of their ballots from the 1800s 
all the way up to the 1960s. But this is this is the kicker for me. Next to the rooster were the two words white supremacy. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh. Now I don't know how you connect roosters well, with white supremacy, but like that's like What do we know about roosters? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but 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 actually it's even worse than that, Kelly, in many ways, um, because it wasn't until nineteen ninety six that the Alabama Democratic Party got rid of the rooster and adopted the donkey as its official animal. Now, the phrase white supremacy, they ditched in the 60s, the civil rights era. But still, yeah, the fact that like this rooster was kicking around um, and yeah, and that, I mean, <laughs> for anyone who wants to sort of just like have any questions, or, well, that, but also <laughs> just, like, anyone who wants to have any questions about what was going on in the South during the Civil War and Reconstruction and into the and all the way into the 1960s, just tell them that the official state motto had a picture of a rooster with the words "white supremacy" next to it. Mm. So this was not about states' rights, folks. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it's kind, of, <laughs> kind no. of amazing. Anything else in this story worth uh, worth laying out there? I'm not sure that mascots are ever really a great idea. I don't know. Maybe it's just like me. This. <laughs> but I feel like the idea of using an animal as a surrogate for your identity is a little problematic. I don't know. Like maybe I like I like um mottos, you know what I mean? I like it like um, you know, Harvard's like Veritas. Truth. Okay, love it. Like, or Wellesley is the blue. <laughs> the blue, yeah. A color, a color, a primary color at that. Like, but you know, I don't know. I just feel like it's it's hard to like once you what is the word anthropomorphize um, um yeah. you make animals into people anthropomorphize. anthropomorphize. Yes. Then it becomes even more. I don't know. Sticky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is before we started recording, we were talking about what alternative uh, mascots could be. And as I was thinking about it, I was just like, the only one I could imagine for either party was just a circus, right? Like a menagerie yeah. of animals. Because <laughs> the idea of one animal representing the party, especially, you know, at this point, seems... Yeah. No, it well, doesn't seem to work. That's, a, that's really interesting. And actually, um, I, I had come across this op-ed by this modern cartoonist, David Horsey, who writes, I believe, you know, I think mostly in the LA Times, but he's syndicated because I've seen him around and I recognize his work. Um, But he wrote this really thoughtful op-ed in 2016 in the heat of that election, basically saying like, you know, as a cartoonist, I've been trained to use this dichotomy, this elephant and, and donkey to represent the two parties. And I know that it has sort of its power, but it gives a false sense of unity within the two parties. And, and he's mm. like, you know, what we're witnessing now on both sides, you know, and he mentions sort of how contentious and fracturous the 2016 primaries were. And he says kind of like, I've had to rethink myself as a cartoonist, I think I'm going to abandon this simple iconography because if my job is to try and convey the sort of nature of politics through my work. Um, it's not just one size of the donkeys and one size of the elephants. There's all sorts of other things going on. And it does sort of, um, I think, hint actually at that very first usage where that guy Nast was, I suppose, at the time, codifying things into these two animals but all those early cartoons have like seven other animals in them too you know and that was <laughs> yeah. a moment where it was like you know yeah. talk about the era in which he was doing that um post-civil war that was an era in which um you know the parties were fractious and there were all sorts of factions and so it wasn't just two animals it was a zoo in every sense of the word but um yeah. I'll, we'll tweet out that david ha- um horsey um up bad because I just thought it was a really interesting perspective mm-hmm. on modern politics through the eyes of a of a cartoonist, someone whose mascot I assume is a horsey. Oh, yeah, well that's that's a little <laughs> too. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. Uh, I know. Um, let's see. There's one other tidbit about this guy Nast. He gave us not just the elephant and the donkey, but he also gave us the modern Santa Claus. He did indeed. Um, A tall, skinny Santa Claus. Um, Coca-Cola would later in the 1920s make Santa a little more rotund and jolly. But yeah, uh, the idea of a Santa Claus that comes to our houses and looks a certain way, right, with that big white beard, uh, that's a Thomas Nast invention. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, It's crazy. All right. Let's leave it there. But listeners, I suppose this is a chance. What what do you want to do, Kelly? You want to ask folks to nominate... Yes, nominate your best mascot <laughs> okay. for, each for party. either party. 
Or for for fractions within the party, if we're going to take on this idea that, okay, we're no longer living in an era of one animal can sum up one party. Um, Tell us us what your uh, petting zoo uh, would look like. (laughs) Your Uh, best mascot for the no labels party. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a chameleon. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I like sloth. Or whatever party, whatever animal is about to go extinct. Yes, uh, okay. the dodo bird. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. We will leave it there. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Radiotopia.